So let's give a big hand of applause for him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, I'm an engineer. I am not a marketing person, but I've got a cool marketing video from our marketing folks. So uh, Orbital Sciences is in the space business. We make satellites, we make rockets. So if you guys are looking for a career that goes fast and high and far, we're happy to talk to you. We have a booth there, and our HR lady is here the rest of the day, if you haven't seen her already. She's awesome. Um, engineering is, when I was in school, many, many years ago, uh, I grew up, you know, I'm a son of Apollo. You know, grew up with Apollo, grew up with Star Trek, and it was like, I got to do that. And went to school, went to the U of A down in Tucson, got my double E degree. I was, at the time, and still am, very interested in astronomy and space exploration. And I wanted to get into the space business. So what I did was I took a lot of astronomy courses, which undergraduate, which is one reason I went down to Tucson, because they have a great undergraduate astronomy program and a great co-op program in their engineering department. And one way I got into a good position early in my career is I did a co-op program. I had the opportunity to go work at NASA, NASA Marshall Space Center for three semesters while I was going to school for my undergraduate engineering degree. Opportunities like that are awesome. You guys have been talking, a lot of people here about internships, co-op programs. Go do that, go get some internship, go get some experience before you get out of school. You get a taste of what it's like in industry, and that might even change what your major is or what direction you wanna go. And that'll give you a much better opportunity to get a really great job when you get your degree and get out into the world. And that goes for you know physics and math and even you know any other non-engineering thing too. So a little plug, a little background for you. Um, I spent my career designing spacecraft. I'm specialized in satellite power systems, solar arrays, batteries, all that kind of cool stuff. And uh, here in Gilbert, Arizona, we've made a whole bunch of neat satellites for NASA and some other agencies. And Orbital has a facility there here in Gilbert, facility down in Chandler, Arizona, where we have our launch systems group. We make rockets and things. And our headquarters is in Dulles, Virginia, which has Dulles, Virginia, which has the lead design responsibilities for a lot of the rocket programs, also commercial geocommunication satellites, and various other uh, science missions. So that's a little bit about me, a little bit about Orbital, very high level. So what I've got, before wasting any more time, uh, again, the topic is commercial space. And in this panel, what we're going to have is kind of two parts to that. One of them is the and they're both new paradigms in the space industry. One of them is where NASA now can get to the point that technology is advanced, that they don't have to worry about launching people and cargo to orbit. You know, that's why the shuttle can be retired. That's, that's old school. The new thing is they're going to buy services, they're going to buy tickets, they're going to buy seats to orbit. Uh, our buddies at SpaceX, they're going to eventually fly astronauts to low Earth orbit. They're delivering cargo, and we're delivering cargo. Commercially, NASA says, do we want X number of kilograms? We bring them X number of kilograms. That's the new model, how this is going to work. That'll allow NASA to go out and do deep space fun things. On the other side, what's developing, and my colleagues up here will talk about that in a little bit, commercial space from a space tourism perspective. The technology has come to the point where you and I, with a deep enough pocket, can take a fun ride into the to reaches of space. So we'll hear a little bit about those two aspects of commercial space. So let's start out with a neat video on our first operational, well, demo mission to resupply the space station. Just finished a few weeks ago. And there we go. Sound? There it is. This is uh, loading up the cargo in the uh, Cygnus cargo vehicle. The Antares liquid propulsion booster. Orbital's approach to implementing this mission was to only invent things that we needed to invent. We bought the booster in the first stage, the recycled moon rocket engines from the Ukraine. The Italians built the cargo module based on the modules they built for the space station. And the spacecraft bus was based on components we use in our geostationary satellites. And we have All that allowed us to keep the bus now. The journey of the G-Data Low Cygnus cargo vehicle to the International Space Station.
was the second flight of the Antares rocket. There'll be another, the first of the operational, first of eight operational resupply missions uh, will be launched in December. Got two more planned for next year. Separation of the Cygnus. spacecraft anymore to dock. You just fly close and the crew grabs it with the arm and berths it. So there's a difference between berthing and docking. Docking is where you fly into the docking mechanism and hook up. Berthing is where you fly close by and they grab it and pull it in and dock that way. It, it simplifies operations tremendously and doesn't require all that technology and autonomous operation on your spacecraft. Once again, keeping costs down because everybody is very sensitive to cost. happy when it works. an astronaut who worked in management at Orbital Virginia for quite a few years and passed away, got this program for us and passed away, I think, about a year ago. No, it's not Sandra Bullock. And they had his picture inside. Okay, I think that's it. I think what we're going to do is we're going to go on with our other, our other panelists. And then we'll all be available for questions at the end on this subject or whatever you think we can answer questions about. So, to my hostess. Okay, so our next speaker is the Vice President of Special Projects at Virgin Galactic. So let's give a nice warm welcome to William Pomerantz. Hi, everybody. How's, you, how's everyone uh, doing? How's your space vision going? All right. This is my favorite conference of the year, so I'm happy to be back. Um, thanks to the, uh, the men and women here at ASU who put the conference together for doing that. Um, I've run a few conferences in my day. It's a ton of work, uh, so well done to all of you. Those of you who haven't hosted a space vision, I hope you're preparing your bids and, and getting ready to defend them uh, tomorrow night or whenever it is. When, when did they get voted on? Is that tomorrow night? Did it happen already? Nobody knows. It's, happen it's happening right now. Okay, well, uh, thanks, y'all, for, for coming here instead of uh, going to that. But next year, go, go to that and bid on it. 
Uh, let's see, enter full screen. Okay, so uh, I just want to talk, oh, um, the three of us wanted to make sure we left a lot of time for questions and answers, because that's the most fun part for us and hopefully for you all. But I did want to give you just a quick overview of what we're doing in Virg at Virgin Galactic in case you haven't heard of it already. Uh, and I like to start, as, as I always do, with this number. Um, who here knows the first date a human being went to space? Shout it out in the back. The first date any human being ever went to space? April 12th, 19. All right, here we go. So we've got the first human in space in the early 60s until today, 542 people went to space. Now, uh, it's great that number isn't zero. It's zero for, uh, for 100 billion people in the history of this planet. It was zero through their entire lifetimes. But uh, that number isn't anywhere near as high as I want that number to be, right? Uh, and at some point, in fact, when I was around your age, when I was a member of a SEDS chapter, I realized that if we continued human spaceflight at those kind of rates, at 10 people a year, I was never going to go. And none of my friends, none of my classmates, none of my professors were ever going to go. The numbers were just stacked against us. And if you had the bad luck of having bad vision or having been born in the wrong country or just having bad timing, you weren't going to get a chance to go. And that was kind of disappointing to me because I, probably like most of you in this room, I really, really, really want to go. Right? My wife wants to go. My friends want to go. My coworkers want to go. And we don't want to go once. We want to go lots and lots and lots of times. Uh, and so we need to change this rate dramatically. We need to add zeros to this. We need to increase by orders of magnitude. And that is not going to happen uh, if we only let governments do it. It's not that NASA isn't smart enough to do it, it's that Congress has never asked NASA to do it, and they certainly have never written them the check to do it. NASA's job isn't to uh, do wish fulfillment and make sure we can all live up to our childhood dreams, as, as fun as that would be. Uh, so um, it's really important to get commercial industry involved, but there's a difference between it being good for commercial industry to be involved and commercial industry being capable of being involved. And at the time when I was a said student, there wasn't a space vision back then, but when I was in said's chapters, uh, nobody really believed that private industry had the capability of sending people to space at commercially reasonable prices. Yes, commercial industry has played an important role in sending people to space, you know, Boeing and Rockwell and all those kind of companies help build the space shuttle, help fly it safely. Uh, but if you went to Boeing or any of those other companies and said, I want to buy a spaceship, the price tag was going to be in the many billions of dollars. If you look at the cost of human spaceflight from URI until today, the costs are staying the same. They're not going down. Space is not like cell phones, right, where every year you can count on your phone either being cheaper or much better or probably both. Space is on, not only is it not on an exponential curve, it's not even headed in the right direction. It's getting a little more expensive with time. Uh, this thing, what you're looking at here, which uh, if you saw Jeff and I laughing uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, I was realizing how young you all were when this was happening and, and feeling a little bit bad about my age. But in 2004, ancient history for some of you in the room, not that long ago for some of us towards the front of the room, uh, this vehicle flew called Spaceship One, first ever privately built vehicle to carry human beings into space, um, and really was an enormous sea change for the industry. It took commercial space flight from being a joke or at best kind of a thought experiment and made it a reality. It taught entrepreneurs, it taught people who might want to buy a ticket that this could happen within our lifetimes. Because not only did that cool looking vehicle go to space and get the Google Doodle and get on the Daily Show and do all those kind of things, uh, that whole vehicle, which in fact is part of a two vehicle system, went from a drawing on a napkin through multiple flights to space and into the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum for about $28 million. $28 million to design, construct, and test a system, that's a commercially reasonable price, especially for a reusable vehicle. If you look at the economics of spaceflight, whether there's humans on top of the rocket or not, the price of every launch is driven by the price of human beings, by the price of the staff, the people who built it, who designed it, the, people, the technicians who maintain it. Right? Rockets are not made out of expensive stuff. Many of you in this room have built a rocket. Rockets are built out of carbon and aluminum. They're fueled out of oxygen. They're fueled out of kerosene. They're fueled out of nitrous oxide. They're not fueled out of dilithium crystals just yet, right? Rocket fuel is not expensive. Sending people to space, the reason the space shuttle fleet cost a billion point three per flight is the fact that there was a, a huge army of very highly trained people who had to be maintained to conduct those flights. Just not true for this vehicle. 
So we at Virgin Galactic are commercializing that technology. Spaceship One was ultimately a test pilot's vehicle. It went to space, it did a lot of great things, but it wasn't a terribly comfortable vehicle. You couldn't get out of your seat, which is what something most people would consider a real requirement for considering themselves in space. The windows were tiny and kind of fogged up. Uh, but it proved that the job could be done. So we said, hey, let's scale it up, build a bigger version, and start selling tickets to anyone who wants to go. Whether you want to go to do research, to test out your latest design for a CubeSat and to get it to some technical heritage, raise its technology readiness level, or whether you just want to go for fun. Or maybe you want to do all those things. You want to fly five times a week. Uh, four of them are for work, and on the weekends you'll go and, and just have a laugh and look out the window. You should be able to do all of those things. Uh, and that, that's what we're trying to make happen. You can find a million videos online about how our system works, but I'll just walk you through it really, really fast. We have a two-vehicle system, a specially made aircraft called the White Knight 2, which I call a catamaran because it's a dual fuselage aircraft. So you see it's the two outer fuselages there in the picture behind me. And then hanging underneath is Spaceship 2. It's an eight-person reusable suborbital spacecraft. So it's two pilots in the front and then six passengers in the back. Or we can pull out some of those seats and put in rack systems if you want to fly autonomous experiments. If you're a scientist or an engineer, you want to test something out in space. So you notice here, Spaceship Two doesn't have any landing gear. It's not touching the runway. It's a passenger. It's, it's physically hooked onto the mothership. Uh, the mothership takes off from a normal runway, spends about an hour climbing up to altitude. We release from 50,000 feet, so that's half again as high as you fly on a commercial airliner. Those of you who flew into Phoenix uh, just yesterday or the day before, you were at probably at about 35,000 feet, most likely. So we'll go up to about 50,000 feet, check out that everything's good, the weather looks good, the systems look good, we got green lights all across the board, and then the two pilots in, uh, in the White Knight 2 aircraft will throw a big lever and will drop the spaceship. She's gonna free fall away from the mothership for about three seconds long enough for, uh, for us to get some good distance between the two and then light up her hybrid rocket motor. That thing's gonna fire for about a minute. It's gonna take you from Mach 0 0.5 to Mach 3.5, getting close to Mach 4, and the pilots are just gonna get a little bit out in front of the aircraft, turn the thing straight vertical, and take you to space. Uh, when you're on board, and I hope that all of you will be on board someday, uh, you're gonna get about four minutes to take your seatbelt off, float around the cabin, experience weightlessness, do your experiment, or just smile and laugh and uh, enjoy it, um, and then you, uh, and then you, then you'll come down. So you, the the big boost phase, and then and then the space flight. Uh, you've seen in some of the other pictures, and you'll see again in others. Uh, we've got a dozen windows in the passenger compartment for six passengers, so you're going to have a nice view. You don't have to worry about an annoying neighbor who's uh, who's hogging the window. Then we have this uh, really, uh, oh, there we go, just another picture. This really uh, interesting way of coming home, which I'm happy to talk about in the question and answer system, but we do something called feathering our wings. It's the way that we re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere very, uh, very safely. Essentially, we're combining all the best traits of being a capsule. It's sort of dummy proof. Uh, you don't care what configuration you're coming home in, what orientation, rather, you're coming home in. Uh, you're gonna spread the heat all across the cabin with the best traits of winged vehicles, lower G loading, uh, and the ability to land with precision on the same runway where you took off from. We feather the wings when we come back in, and then we just come home as a glider, uh, land on the same runway from which you took off uh, about an hour and a half to two hours uh, after, after original takeoff. So we've now signed up about 650 customers. These are people who have paid $200,000, $250,000 each uh, to go to space. So 650 customers, that's you know, probably a, a minute or two's worth of business for our sister company, Virgin, uh, Virgin America. For an airline, that's not big business. But as we talked about at the beginning, only 542 people have ever been to space. Uh, so we're on pace to more than double the number of astronauts within our first year, year or two of service. I get really excited about that because when I look at the NASA astronaut corps, or the Russia, Russian cosmonaut corps, or the Chinese taikonaut corps, I see some amazing men and women who've done incredible things but also, I don't see a population that looks like this room, right? They're all the same age. They're all in peak physical condition. They all come from really one of three academic backgrounds. They're either military test pilots or they're doctors or they're PhDs, right? They're not artists or entertainers or lawyers. They don't have bad vision. They aren't 90 years old or 18 years old. They all kind of look the same. I, I come from a science background. Those of you who are scientists know you need a good sample set, right? The astronauts don't constitute a really robust sample set for a number of types of experiments. And they also don't communicate the joy of space, the excitement of space, that presumably everyone in this room shares. They only, compete, they only communicate that to certain people. You know, probably you in this room have maybe met an astronaut or a couple of astronauts, but most of your high school friends haven't. 
And if you come from a different country or you're a first generation immigrant, your parents probably never have, and no one maybe from their entire region has. Think about how it impacted you when you first met an astronaut, when you came to a Space Vision conference and you talked to one of them, and what it made you want to do in your career. Uh, what happens when we have the first Pakistani woman to go to space, flies to space with us, and is able to go back to her region and speak to her people who look like her, who talk like her, who come from the same cultural background as she does, and communicate to them why she went, what she wanted to do, how she got there, what they can do when they grow up. I think there's a huge social impact to that. And also, you know, we have a number of celebrity customers, the Justin Bieber's and the, the Leonardo DiCaprio. Some people may be excited about them. Some people may be less excited about them. The reason I'm excited about them is because they do communicate to a group of people who aren't like us. They're not going to Washington, D.C. and telling their senator and their congressperson they need to increase the NASA budget. They're not watching the Antares and Cygnus launch glued to their television screens or to their computers and just rooting that on. And maybe they become that because they watched Beaver go to space or something like that, and I, I get excited about that. Just quickly, um, in addition to the human suborbital program, Spaceship Two, we now have a, a small satellite launcher called Launcher One. We can't put people on this, but we can put sort of 500-pound satellites, carry them up to orbit. Uh, we have looked at all the amazing things that people at universities and space agencies are doing with smaller and smaller satellites and saying, boy, there needs to be a better way to get those up into space. Piggyback rides are great, but it's hard to deal with piggyback rides sometimes because you don't know when they're going to happen. You might not know if they're going to happen. You don't know what spaceport they're launching from, what orbit they're going to, and you've got a big customer who's telling you, here's all the things you can't do. You can't have onboard propulsion. You can't have deployable mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. What if for about the same price that you pay for a secondary launch, you could now be the primary passenger? What would that enable each of you to do how could you get space on a Moore's Law curve because you're launching at low prices and you can do sort of disposable satellites that you're going to replace next year anyway, so why not put the current generation of technology in them instead of space-proven things that are four or five generations old? Um, lastly, I just wanted to uh, note this. Virgin Galactic and our sister company, TSC, the spaceship company, we have about 300 employees and about 100 job openings. We are hiring a lot. And really, I'm super happy to report at Space Vision for the first time, we are hiring young people. So uh, we just opened up our applications for interns, for summer interns. It's only the second time we've ever done that. Our first internship program, about two-thirds of our interns got permanent job offers. So we're looking for the best and the brightest of you who want to come and join us full time. I hope you'll come down and talk to me afterwards. Uh, I brought as many business cards as I could, but get to me before I, before I give them all out. Uh, and, uh, and apply quickly. And I think that's it. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Okay. Our next speaker is the Chief Executive Officer of Orbital Outfitters. Uh, so let's give a big round of applause here for Jeff Feige. Thank you much. I'll just, how about I just use your slide? I'll let, I'll let him fight it for a minute. In the meantime, I'll cover my... Uh, Well, anyway, while they're uh, chasing my slides, I I'm going to follow up with Will a little bit on absolutely one of my favorite topics. So the conversation we're having is commercial space. And uh, I love what Will had to say because I pretty much couldn't agree more with the general tone of it. Um, if the only thing space is about is federally funded science programs. That's really interesting. We should do that. The country should do it. We should keep paying for it, go out there, vote, and support those. That's all great. But I don't think that engages all that many people. There is a subset of our community that's going to think that's really exciting, and we should all support it because it's better for all the people who don't know that it's good for them. But how exciting is that? If the conversation we're having, on the other hand, is about 
going to space and not people, the phrase I like to use is not people who are better than me going to space, but people like me, then it's a much more interesting conversation. So um, what am I going to do here today? I am going to very quickly tell you about Orbital Outfitters. And then after that, I am going to try to rush to the question and answers because, as Will and Michael said, that is by far our preferred part of this event, and we'd much rather talk to you. Oh, and one more point before I dive in and talk about Orbital Outfitters. Every one of the speakers here, be it the guys on this panel or be it other people that you're seeing in other events, there's just about nobody here who's not easy to talk to. And whether you're looking for a job or an internship or you just want to know more about what they're doing, you're at this event and we're at this event to talk to each other. So please, come up, approach us, say, hey, I really like what you're doing. I really don't like what you're doing. I don't understand what you're doing. I want to know more. I want to work for you. Maybe I want to work for you. I don't want to work for you, but I want to work for one of your suppliers. How do I talk to them? There's a whole lot of you here. I don't know who everybody is. I certainly don't know who most people are by name. But if you come up to me, introduce yourself, say, my name is this. I'm interested in this. Please tell me about that. Then this was an event that was worthwhile for both of us. So please don't miss that opportunity. That's why you're here. Make sure to take advantage of it. All right. Well, I'm going to do my best to run pretty quickly through these, uh, presentation, this presentation here. Let me tell you about, a little bit about Orbital Outfitters first. We are the first and certainly the most established, what I would say, new space, space and pressure suit company. That is, we were founded specifically to support the commercial market. We were founded specifically to address the fact that there were not, and until our existence, there, you know, there simply did not exist a line of commercial spacesuits that was affordable and that really was designed for the emerging new space commercial market, your Virgins, your X-Cores, your Blue Origins, your SpaceX's, companies like that. We've been around since late 2006. We're on our, currently on our third generation of our IS-3 suit, which is the one that'll be flying on X-Core's Lynx vehicle. We have done work for a range of other companies and NASA. Um, just an interesting subset of some of, the, some of the work that we've done. We've worked for uh, X-Core, SpaceX, Hamilton Sunstrand, NASA itself. We've worked with universities, Texas A&M. We've done a lot of our own research. Almost all of the energy we've put in lately has been on IVA suits, or if in, in NASA speak, intravehicular activity suits. What does that mean? It means we're not building big white spacewalking suits. We would really like to do that. But at the end of the day, we are a commercial company focused on a commercial market. Uh, very quickly, some of you know this, some of you don't, but what's the purpose of a spacesuit? It's not just so that you can breathe. It's so that you can breathe to protect you from the pressure environment, to protect you from the thermal environment, uh, in some vehicles to protect you from the noxious fuels that might or might not uh, be encountered in an emergency situation in that vehicle. There have been a whole lot of approaches to suits along the way. We've got the approach that we're taking is what we believe is the most... Uh, best compromise between economics and performance to do what we need to do and make an affordable suit system. A um, little comment about suit safety. Suits are a vehicle subsystem. They aren't the clothes you wear on launch day. They aren't something that you can just get into and use. I often like to point out in longer presentations that there's a whole lot of dirty laundry associated with suits. That is all true. You know, there are discomfort factors, there are cost factors, there are complexity factors, there are risk factors. But at the end of the day, if the engineer who is building the vehicle says you're going to need a suit, you have a whole other set of problems. That said, there's no other good way out of this situation other than, uh, basically, there's no other good way to protect yourself other than a suit. Uh, again, a little bit of stuff on past work. Uh, we've got some pictures of our work for XCOR. We've got some pictures of our work for SpaceX, some of our internal work, uh, some of our work with Texas A&M up there. Just a little bit of history and pictures to give you guys an idea of what we do, the kinds of things that we're working on. 
Um, other stuff that we played with for other people, suits don't have to have uh, hard elements, big metal helmets. You can make all soft helmets. You can make all soft suits. You can make all hard suits. You can make suits a variety of them. You can use plastics. You can use metals. You can use a bunch of different materials. We've done some of this prototypically. We've done other of it, other of that kind of work at the design phase. Where we're going isn't the only thing we're interested in doing. It's not the only way to solve the problem. Just wanted to give you sort of a notion of what's out there in terms of suits generally. One other thing I wanted to talk about, we've opened a new line of business recently, which is full-scale vehicle mock-ups. Um, we did one of these for x -Core. We've done, uh, we actually did an in-house one where we uh, built a wireframe of a Dragon capsule just to prove out a concept. Um, that lunar lander is the one from, uh, it's actually from a lot of things. That's from Earth to the Moon and Apollo 18. We did both the interior and the exterior of that. Uh, the thing down in the corner is actually the uh, transformational space mock-up. So before we were actually a company, the same team built that, and that is a full-scale capsule that you can actually climb into. And this is something where it's been an interesting business for us over the last few years because, first, um, we've sold a whole lot more of these than the market for spacesuits currently supports. But also, and even more interestingly, we started to realize that if we can build a whole capsule mock-up and we can build a safe spacesuit and we know how that suit works and we can pressurize that suit, now we can do vastly better quality human factor simulations of what it's like inside the vehicle than any other company can do turnkey all in one place. And that activity has been something that's been a big, uh, basically, advantage for us and something we've done a lot of. So I hate to have done more of a, here's what my company does and here's what we're working on, whereas I feel like Will got to say all the things I really wanted to say about why we're actually doing this and, you know, this is not the kind of business you get into if you're not trying to change the world. But I'm going to leave more of that for the question and answer. I'm going to climb up on the, uh, the dais with the, my other speakers here. And uh, let's just jump into some questions. Question for uh, uh, each one of you. I was wondering how uh, someone who's not involved with either engineering or business can get involved with this industry because it seems like that's basically what you guys have been looking for recently. I think there are a million and one ways. Uh, you, you started by coming here to Space Vision and, and you can continue to get involved by running your SEDS chapters and by hosting Space Vision in future years. Join other organizations, Space Frontier Foundation or Planetary Society or, or any of those, all of those organizations are explicitly set up to uh, both appeal to and to take advantage of the talents of people who are not just engineers and scientists. So, so there's lots of those kinds of roles uh, in terms of spreading the word, in terms of becoming politically active, uh, in terms of just educating. You prob probably noticed this if you were a space geek a few years ago and you were watching the media portray what was happening at the end of the space shuttle era. And, you saw you know, NASA shutting down all, all of these things that you knew were not right. Uh, you can help spread the word on those. There are also, um, you know, go to a, I, I like a website called uh, Space Hack. It lists a ton of website or a ton of collaborative projects where you can contribute your effort to crowdsource kind of things. Uh, some of those are for engineers, but some of those are doing sort of massively distributed data uh, analysis and, and other things like that. So th there's lots of roles, and it's increasing with every passing day. Roles for non-engineers, non-scientists. I have a few seconds on this, and then, Michael, if you have anything. But um, very briefly, uh, when I look at my company, I have a handful of people doing business, and I have a handful of people who would strictly call themselves engineers. I also have people who started in the costume business who are, who are now what I would call engineering sellers or structural sellers. I have artists on staff. We have to. Um, we have people who are looking at uh, web and media stuff on staff. And frankly, there you can't really go to school to learn most of what is being done in these companies. That There's not enough of it going on that colleges have begun teaching what we teach. I have people, I have two people in my organization who do not have degrees at all. The thing to understand is it's about engagement and understanding where your strengths are and learning where your strengths are. And talking and talking and talking. That's why I was saying talk to Will, talk to me, talk to everybody at this event and say, this is what I'm interested in. 
Where can that fit? Someone here can, can find a place for you. I assure you the Space Frontier Foundation can. Just, just in general, in, in the space and business, there's a lot more than engineering to make things happen. You've got business people. You've got people who inspect parts. You've got buyers. You've got people who keep the stock room checked. You've got assemblers who are just technicians without degrees. They, they actually get their hands on and build the stuff. Uh, so all sorts of skill sets are needed to make uh, things fly. Hi, my name is Chris Nye. I'm from University of Colorado. And my question is uh, to the panel and in regard to uh, there's a lot of buildup for things that are going to be happening in the next couple of years for human commercial spaceflight. And I was interested to hear your opinions on what critical step needs to be taken between when there's the initial rush and influx of customers and then once, like to keep it from fizzling out what needs to happen. Say you have 500 tickets sold for Virgin Galactic. What if those are like the only 500 people with that market cap to invest and, and take that experience? What needs to happen to lower the cost and the barrier of entry? It's a great question, and it's something that we certainly think about. And uh, I suppose fundamentally, none of us know the answer for sure. But uh, but we, but we have our guesses. Uh, I think we're we're really fortunate in that the thing that we love, people in this room, we all love, is something that most people at least really like. And you probably have noticed this. People may think it's weird how much time you devote to your SEDS chapter or your major, but probably all your friends kind of think it's cool. Uh, and, and that is true of almost every demographic in the world. Uh, so I think as long as we all continue doing a, a good job of engaging people of what we're doing, we've got a, a big help. Another issue that I think is that we need to um, continue to show signs of progress. If you think about why did people care so much about space in the 60s, and not that much in the 70s and the 80s. Well, in the 60s, every single mission was doing something that had never been done before, right? We charted out this incremental path that took us from Alan Shepard to Neil Armstrong in only a few years. And every step along that way, it was the first time we had two people in space, first time someone slept in space, the first time we did an airwalk or a spacewalk in space, you know, all these different kind of things. And then we had Space Shuttle, which, unless you were really an expert, every mission kind of looked the same. We gotta find a way to do that. Some of that is gonna be what I was talking about, having the first person from a demographic group go. You know, the first person who looks like X goes. The person who comes from that background does Y goes. Um, but we gotta find, find other things as well. At, not necessarily at any one individual company, but if the industry is doing that, I think it keeps it all in the public eye. You know, I, I could add stuff, but that's, that's, that's the answer to the question. Let's, let's move on to another question, unless you wanna no, jump in. I don't in. have anything to add. That, that, you're right. <laughs> so uh, we talked about how there's different disciplines that can participate in your companies. You said things like lawyers and people with bad eyesight and things like that. Um, but if you could talk a little bit more about your career paths in particular, and for those people in the room who don't know, I'm sure we can look it up online and see where you studied and whatnot, but more specifically what it was that you did in your time as a student and shortly thereafter that you think put you as such a leading member in the space exploration community. Not being an engineer or being an engineer. Which I'll other. just jump in because I kind of hit that when I gave my little intro. Again, uh, I as a kid was inspired by space and wanted to be in it. So I said engineering's the path. I was very interested in astronomy and space research. So I found a school that I could study, because most colleges, at least years ago, didn't have maybe astronomy 101. And I thought, if I knew about the stuff the scientists are studying, because I didn't think I was smart enough to be a PhD astronomer, okay, uh, at least I knew a little about it, I could help design the instruments that they take to measure it and maybe help my chance of getting a job in the space business building spacecraft. Uh, so I went to a school down in Tucson that had undergraduate astronomy. I got my engineering degree, made an effort to go get some co-op experience in the aerospace industry, got it right out of school, got a job at McDonnell Douglas, was working on the probe to Jupiter in my first year, and brand new technology spacecraft batteries. So you, you set yourself up with those kind of opportunities. I joined, I was chairman of my student branch of AIAA. SEDS didn't exist back in those, what are they called, bearskin and, and stone ages, I said, um, but uh, you do things like that and you, vastly improve your chances of getting a job in an interesting place. So that was my path. 
That's actually a real hard question for me to answer because this is just a total accident. I don't know how the heck I got here. <laughs> um, oh, that one died. Uh, all I can say is kind of what I said before about talk to as many people as you possibly can and try to find your foothold. I mean, offhand, I went, th I mean, this is the skip, hop, skip, jump path, and I'll just rattle off jobs, ignoring um, one or two entrepreneurial ventures that I did in my spare time starting companies, okay? But here's the hop, skip, and a jump. Um, space camp counselor to governor's advisor on aerospace to... Uh, space policy assistant to space policy associate to helping business development at T-Space to doing uh, business development for Orbital Outfitters to running Orbital Outfitters. That's 10 years. I can't tell you how to make that path other than talk to a lot of people Always keep your ears open. Always be saying, well, what do I have to contribute to that? What do they need? Do they need something that they don't already have? Is there something that I can do that, you know, they don't even know that they need? I mean, I, I can, I'll make a general comment. Many of the new space companies are very good at some core competency and poor bordering on disastrous at other things. I mean, there's there's no other nice way to say it. I could, if you you know, if we got into it, I could say it about my company, and I can tell you about it at Virgin, and I can tell you about it at Xcore, and I can sure as heck tell you about it at SpaceX and Orbital and everywhere. They're good at some things, and there are other things they're really not good at. And if you happen to be good at one of those other things and can sell yourself in there, you can contribute in a huge way. And I like to think that's what I've done because I'm crappy at science and math but I'm pretty good at talking to people and I love this space stuff. So. I want to jump back in because you, I don't want to step on, on, on our, everybody else, but one thing you said, mentioned something that, that caught me and that happened to me too in an engineering path is you jumped around all over the place. Even in an engineering path, you don't expect you to put together a plan for your career and it to go the way you think because things out of your control are going to happen. Uh, Programs are going to get canceled. Space shuttles are going to crash. Uh, the economy is going to go bonkers. Presidents change. All those things are out of your control, and they will affect your career path. So keep your options open. Keep networking. Be willing to accept that things are going to change around you that you have no control over. And don't worry about those things you can't control. And, and that sounds a little bit, that's why what you, your path reminded me of that example to these young folks keep in mind. Um, for me, it all started with joining SEDS, um, so that's why I love space vision so much. Uh, my academic background is in, in planetary science. I went to work for NASA as a summer intern, and I absolutely hated it. I thought it was just the worst. It was so boring, and I couldn't justify when people asked me why on earth anyone was paying me to do what I was doing. I, I, I found a hard time answering that question to a way, level that satisfied myself, much less the other person. Um, and through hanging out with a bunch of wild and crazy entrepreneurs, people like Jeff, I realized that for me personally, I like that entrepreneurial world much more. There's nothing wrong with that other world. It's better suited to a lot of people, but it wasn't my style. Uh, so I tried to uh, get myself into the entrepreneurial world and was doing all the things Jeff said. It was going, passing out business cards, I was writing a note on the back of this business card. Where did I meet this person? What do we talk about? Sending a follow-up email, getting a good context. Because the uh, speaker, Jeff's totally right when he says the speakers of this conference, not just the three of us, but everyone is here because they want to talk to you. They're super approachable. But also, they're going to meet 300 of you over the weekend. They might not remember which one was you specifically. So take it upon yourself to remind them. We talked about this job, and I asked you this question about this, and I was really interested, and I did some more research in what, to what, what you told me. Now you've just. Put a cue in mind. Your SEDs, I like SEDs. Uh, you did your homework on this. We had an interesting conversation. Okay, I, I like this kid. I'm going to recommend this person. Uh, and then particularly within the entrepreneurial, but really within any of these sector, sectors, I, I have found I was surprised in a field that so many of us are so passionate about, and I would work in this for free if I had to. There are a lot of people for whom it is just a job. 
and you'll be in a lot of meetings throughout your career where a task comes up and it's not specifically someone's job and you're on a teleconference and they say, who's going to do this? And the crickets chirp for a while. Uh, if you're the girl, if you're the guy who always is saying, I don't know how to do it, but I'll try my best. I'll teach myself. Does anyone want to help me? I'll put together a team. I'll take a swing. People notice that. And that's what gets you the promotion really, really quickly where it stops mattering that you only have one year of experience and your GPA wasn't that great. And instead, you're, the, you're that person who gets stuff done. Uh, so go out and do that. I got I to gotta follow you, Will. I, I, I want to give a quick example, and I'll, I'll reserve their name. An employee who worked for us for a few years and then moved on to people who could pay her more. And, uh, but here's a, here's, a, here's a quick story. Someone who was doing a university project uh, that I met at a SEDS conference said, I am just fascinated with what you're doing. I've read all your web stuff. I've read all the articles about you. I met one person who had met you and asked everything that they knew about your company. And all I want to do is work with you guys. And my thought at the time was, I don't have the money to pay this person, but OK, fine. And what do I do? I'll, so I'll put the card in the pile and kind of on with it. A week later, I get another email. Is there anything that you need? Here's my skill sets. Here's my resume. Is, the, resume. is there anything I can volunteer to help with? Is there anything I can do as a favor? And you know, a couple of weeks later, guess what? We have a big NASA proposal on our desk, and nobody has enough time to do anything. You can create a compliance matrix. You can do all, you know, and before you know it, guess what? We had our most active, youngest, most engaged person who was working their butt off for the company who we were thrilled with as an employee and who's actually moving up ahead at, at their new job. So, you know, just to echo Will's story, I got real world examples, some of doing it myself and some of having seen people do it within our organization. You, you just got to get out there and engage and put yourself up first. We can. Hi, uh, this is Bhaskar from uh, University of uh, Colorado Boulder. I have two questions, one for the orbital. Uh, so when you were berthing with the IS, uh, there was some problems with the positioning systems, and you guys managed to solve it through a software patch. But I would like to know if there are challenges where you cannot do it with a software patch, how uh, would you guys go about it? As in, um, What little I know about that is the, um, in the initial rendezvous with the station with Cygnus, I had to be delayed because NASA used a GPS reference date that was different than what we were using. And I believe I read that NASA used the wrong one. We followed the spec. They were using some old one. They never used the updated spec. And it was usually in these instances, it's easier to, to change the little guy than the big guy. So we went and added an offset to the date, and everything was happy. So it was just, it was, and this, this is what a lot of engineering is about, is managing interfaces. And that's why the space, one of the most amazing things about the space station, that whole thing was never assembled until you got to orbit. You know, now you might, yeah, check out these things mate, but you building something that is not in its final configuration until it's actually up and, and launched. And, and that's quite a bit of analysis in uh, industrial magic, so. Uh, and, and once in a while, you're going to run into something where, oops, this interface isn't quite right. And it was the GPS uh, reference date, apparently. Uh, my second question is uh, towards Will. Uh, are there any visions for EVA with, in your uh, product? Uh, not right now. It's something we'll think about. You know, uh, we all watch Felix Baumgartner do, do his jump. and. Um, and, and Sir Richard uh, did sort of an open letter to, to, to him and to his team uh, congratulating him. And, and in that, he said, perhaps someone will break that record someday from Spaceship Two. Uh, he loves that idea. Our marketing people love that idea. Our engineers hate that idea. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not something we're planning on now. Um, but you know, one of the reasons that we give our vehicles these horribly uncreative names like Spaceship Two and Launcher One is that it implies that there will someday be a Spaceship Three and a Launcher Two and things like that. Uh, so what we're working on now is getting smarter in the kind of areas where we can do much more capable vehicles, and that's one of the capabilities that would certainly be very interesting. Hi, um, I'm Jules Feldhacker, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, my question, I guess, would most be appropriate for Jeff, but I 
appreciate any of your input as well. What advice, other than you touched on networking a few times, but what advice would you have for people who are interested in actually starting up one of these new space emerging companies, um, particular, particularly for those of us who might be busy with you know, school, other jobs, things like that? I, I have a couple things. Uh, networking, I don't even need to beat you up on because I even recognize you. So good, good on you. And you've been volunteering for organizations. I know that too. Good on you, number two. Um, to be specific to your question, um, we were talking about this this morning when we were judging the business panel plan competition. The purpose of that competition is for the teams who are bidding. The purpose of that competition is so that you can watch those teams bid and learn the, what the judges and the advisors and advocates have to say about those plans because that is a spectacular place to look and listen and learn. Um, some of the general things that I was saying before are important in the sense of being plugged into the industry and seeing where the opportunities were and are and will be in the future. Um, let me tell you just a very quick story about Orbital Outfitters, then I've got another example, and I'm sure I can tell Will's got something good to say on this topic too. So uh, very quickly on Orbital Outfitters. All other crap aside, why we were founded. We were founded because in a hotel bar, myself, Chris Paradis, and Rick Tumlinson had beers with Jeff Grayson when x was four people effectively in a garage. And they said, if we build a suborbital vehicle and we have our personnel wear suits in that vehicle and we want to aim for a price point of 100 or 200K, whatever you like, then the notion of a $200,000 suit, it completely ruins our entire business plan. And unless there is a suit that is reusable and adaptable to a wide range of users and that you don't have to throw away after each use or that isn't custom fit to people, if that does not exist, our whole business plan does not close. And that conversation followed by the conversation, but if there was a company, you'd write a contract to them right off, right? That conversation is Orbital Outfitters, okay? And that is 2005. And it took us a year and a half to even get around to actually doing it. That's how early that kind of stuff has. So what I'm saying there is you need to be plugged in with the industry. And that's where the volunteering and the networking and the contacts and things go up. I am sure, I, I know a few of them offhand, but I'd, I'm sure if you hung out with guys like Will, and I can tell you, you hang out with guys like me, we could rattle off a handful of things that we know today are not being done well and would create an opening or entry for a new person. It could be as small as component level stuff. It could be as big as vehicle servicing or vehicle fueling or who's going to operate all these suborbital vehicles or who's going to, you know, are there going to be multiple uh, suborbital lines? You know, uh, here's an example that is a sort of bigger than everybody here right now, but one day, um, x -Corps doesn't want to operate vehicles. They've said that a bunch of times in public. They want to be Boeing and they want American Airlines and Delta and United and everybody else to come and buy their vehicles. That's all they want to do. Guess what? There's a whole set of new businesses that have to exist there, some of which exist, some of which don't, some of which we keep hearing about in the wings. Plugged into the industry, know what's going on, network, to address your, the latter point, which is um, about how busy, you know, life, school, whatever you want. I don't know any nice way to say this. That never gets better. <laughs> okay. It only ever gets worse. I'm not going to go home until Thanksgiving because I'm on the road that much going to conferences and meetings and a suit test and another meeting and a fundraising dinner and on and on and on. And... You just, you know, you just got to figure ways. There are compromises that you have to make at some point. And I'm not saying which one you should make or which one makes sense for you or how you should manage that. But it's always going to be that way. And I'm sure everybody here could tell you a story about my spouse or my significant other thinks that it's crap that I don't come home till this time. Or they do the same job and they think it's great that I stay at work all that long. Or, you know, I don't ever get to do my hobby because it's this or that. You know, luckily my hobby is airplanes and spaceships, and that's all I do with my day. 
Well, I've got a bunch of airplanes, too. <laughs> um, two really quick things. One, if you're thinking of starting a business, I recommend you start it on Monday. Uh, I think I would offer, Jeff, disagree with me or Michael, uh, I think even in failure, you would learn more from doing that than you would from a semester of school. Get, stay on in school, finish school, but start the business. It's awesome. Uh, and then secondly, I would say never make the mistake of thinking that you're too young. Uh, we were just judging a business plan competition. We were saying the quality of the presentations with a little bit of coaching, quality of the presentations, the idea you were coming with are just the same as what was happening at the, the business plan competition not for students, two weeks ago, at which the prize was $100,000 or something. So My company, when Dave Thompson started, he was right out of school. Yeah, right. That's right. That too young thing, man, you're never, you're never too young to do this. You're, it's never too early. You never don't know enough. And that, that's the last thing. Not to endorse this, this notion of, oh, school's not helpful or, or whatever else, but most of what we do, not the hard engineering, but there, a lot of what we do there aren't classes in. You know, I, I've, I've met about 100 MBAs, and I've met two of them who I'm like, they would never have been that good without school. It, it, it's, you just got to get out and do it. And boy, the failures do teach you. I, I mean, the, that's, that's where it's at. Hello. My question is for uh, Mr. Pomerantz about the future of Virgin Galactic. Uh, Spaceship One was followed by Spaceship Two pretty, pretty quickly, and you mentioned that there will eventually be a successor. So has any real work begun on a Spaceship Three, and when it eventually does, if it hasn't already, do you see the focus being more on lowering the cost of entry or increasing the capabilities such as longer uh, time wait lists, for instance? Yeah, uh, all great questions. Um, we don't have any like full-time staff dedicated to it, but uh, a lot of us spend some time thinking about what is Spaceship 3 and, and 4 and 5 and Launcher 2 and when do those two things blend in together and start becoming the same kind of a thing. Um, and we're trying to do it in a very delicate way. We recognize, heck, we don't have the first vehicle flying. Let's not get too far in front of ourselves and be planning the fifth one or the sixth one. But also having those long-term goals helps inform the decisions that we're making today. So for example, it's not self-evident to me that we would have done Launcher 1, and certainly not that we would have done Launcher 1 in-house, building our own propulsion the ways that we are, if we didn't think that those taught us interesting things that we could later apply to Spaceship 3 or Spaceship 4 or Spaceship 5. So we have to be smart enough about what those things might be to say, hey, do we need more advanced propulsion or is what we have cut it? Do we need better TPS or is that not an area that, that's a focus for us? Um, I suspect we'll probably look at both routes, both lowering the cost of similar services, although I probably would call that like a Spaceship 2.1 rather than a Spaceship 3, and then adding capability sets. The one Sir Richard is most excited about, he's a guy who spends almost all of his life on airplanes. If he spent life, less of his life on airplanes because the airplane was moving a lot faster, he'd be pretty happy. So he has given us his goal. He's not an engineer. He barely started school, much less finished. But the, the thing he's put in front of us is like, I want, you know, Phoenix to Singapore in 45 minutes. How, how do I make that happen? That's not Spaceship 2. That's probably not Spaceship 3. That might not be Spaceship 5. But we're going to get there someday, um, and, and we're definitely on that path. Thank you. OK, that was our last question. Sorry, guys. You can talk to them after. <laughs> yeah, so let's give one more round of applause to them. So our next talk will be the closing keynote at 5 o'clock, so don't, don't leave. <laughs>